On behalf of JLF Colorado, festival co-directors Namata Gokhale and William Dalrymple, festival producer Sanjoy Roy, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, Boulder Public Library, and the City of Boulder, we wish you all a good morning, and we welcome you to this session of JLF Colorado 2021 Virtual Festival. Presenting Miss Burma and the Names for Light, Charmaine Craig and Thiri Mo co mint in conversation with Anindita Ghosh. A powerful session weaving together the personal and the political. Academic and writer Charmaine Craig's novel, Miss Burma, vividly intertwines the fate of a country and a family, not only by war and revolution, but also by desire and loss. While writer Thiri Mo co mints memoir, Names for Light, a family history, traverses through oral narratives, official and mythical histories of Myanmar and binds together three generations of a family and the impact of post-colonial violence and racism. In conversation today with writer and journalist Anindita Ghosh, author of The Illuminated and former features director Vogue India, they take us on an evocative journey through time memory and the search for legacy. Charmaine Craig is the author of the novels, The Good Men and Miss Burma. Long list for the National Book Award and the Women's Prize for Fiction. Her essays have appeared in venues, including the New York Times Magazine and Narrative Magazine. Thiri Mio Ko Mintz is the author of the novel, The End of Peril, The End of Enmity, The End of Strife, a Haven and a book of nonfiction, Names for Light, a family history. She's an assistant professor of English at Amherst. Anindita Ghosh is an author and journalist based in Mumbai. Her first novel, The Illuminated, was published in India this summer to critical acclaim and is a bestseller. She was previously the editor of the Saturday magazine Mint Lounge and the features director of Vogue India. Please do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. In these times, we've struggled to bring you JLF Colorado 2021 without charging a registration fee. To allow the continuous and free flow of knowledge and information, we request you to extend your support by donating generously to the festival. Your support is truly appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our pleasure to present Miss Burma and the Names for Light, Charmaine Craig and Thiri Mo Ko Mint in conversation with Anindita Ghosh. Over to you, Anindita. Thank you so much. Um, good day to everyone joining us from uh, different time zones uh, and to my co-panelists, Charmaine and Thiri. I'm delighted to be in conversation with uh, Charmaine Craig, most recently the author of Miss Burma, and Thiri Mio Chio Miet, whose second book, Names for Light, was published in August. Uh, my first novel, The Illuminated, was published in the Indian subcontinent two months ago, and it's been, you know, two months of being at the receiving end of questions. So I'm very glad uh, to be here today with uh, two very accomplished women and uh, you know, to speak to them about uh, their respective books. Uh, we've all been uh, introduced, so I'm going to get straight to it, but I do want to kind of give you a little more context about both Charmaine and Thierry's books, which I've greatly enjoyed reading in the last two weeks. Um, Charmaine Craig's Miss Burma is her second novel. It's set in Myanmar from the 1940s to the 1960s. Uh, it's based on the story of her maternal grandparents and her mother, uh, who is the titular Miss Burma. Uh, her grandmother belonged to the persecuted Karen minority. Her grandfather was uh, an Indian Jewish a soldier in the British military. Um, her mother was uh, not only the first Miss Burma, but she also went on to become a rebel leader, leading the Karen National Liberation Army in their fight for independence against the Burmese forces. So her photographs online while I was, you know, researching for this session go from these uh, lovely beauty pageant pictures uh, to her in, in full kind of military fatigues. And uh, some of you might already know that the Karen conflict is the world's longest running civil war. 
and we're going to hear more from Charmaine through the course of the session, of course. Uh, Thiri Myo Chio Miet's Names for Light is also her second book. Uh, it's a memoir uh, stretching from Myanmar, where she was born, to Thailand, California, Spain, and Colorado, where she spent some time growing up. It's an unconventional memoir in which she traces how her family history has haunted her personal journey. Uh, to give you a sense of what I mean by unconventional, uh, Miet introduces herself as a reincarnation of her great-grandfather, who was a relative of the royal family in Myanmar. This happens very early on in the book, in the first few pages. Uh, so Names for Light has ideas like reincarnation, it straddles myth and folklore. In one of the blurbs uh, for the book by the Vietnamese writer V. Ki Nao, which I found very interesting, uh, the blurb says, Thiri is driving an important autobiographical rickshaw into the 21st century. I thought that was a fabulous discussion. I mean, a description. I hope, I hope there are more blurbs, you know, as fun as that. Uh, to start off with, I'd like to ask both of you, Charmaine and Thiri, the inverse question. Uh, while both of your books are about family and politics intersecting, and it's about war and revolution, um, I'm interested in, Charmaine, uh, your choice to go with uh, fiction uh, when the book could... Uh, I'd like you to speak a bit about, I mean, you are a novelist, your first book was fiction as well, but I'm curious why you went, you know, kind of why this was written as fiction. And in Thiri's choice to go with a memoir that is so layered with dreams, folklore, myth and speculative history that could have just as easily been fiction. So could we start with you, Charmaine? Yes, and I have to apologize. I didn't hear all of your question because I... Part of it dropped off. Can you hear me? Can you, is all? Yes. All, am I coming across? Okay, I'm so glad. I'll do my best. Um, you know, I I grew up knowing how dramatic my mother's story was, her her parents' story was, and I felt a, a, a calling to, um, to tell this family story and also the story of my mother's people um, in Burma, Myanmar. But as a fiction writer, I'm principally interested in motivation, in that sort of collision of feelings we have, those internal conflicts where we can be um, driven in sort of oppositional ways. Hearing my mother's story when I was a child, um, I never really quite understood how someone so private, um, someone who called herself a pacifist, could have been not only um, you know a beauty queen and a movie star, but also a revolutionary, as you said. And so what I was really passionately trying to do in the book more than anything, at least initially, was to uh, discover for myself, because my mother was so private, she couldn't really explain it to me, what those motivations were that led her to these actions. So I was less interested in the big events, if you will, initially at least, and more interested in those private longings, those private perceptions, those private drives um, that animate fiction. And that, that was really the main reason why I, 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 I jumped into the project as a piece of, of fiction rather than nonfiction. Right. Uh, Thierry, what about you? You know, the memoir is so unconventional, I'm sure. I'm sure people, you know, might mistakenly review it as fiction or, you know, might kind of read it as fiction. So. What was the reason you decided to, you know, uh, go with a memoir rather than uh, call it fiction where you could have taken possibly, you know, further liberties? Yeah, that's a wonderful question, Anidita. And thank you so much for your introduction of our books. Um, I have to confess that I don't really consider my book a memoir. I didn't consider it a memoir when I was writing it. Um, I'm sort of genre blind, I guess, when I write. I don't really think about how my book is going to be packaged or marketed when I'm writing a book. I just sort of, I don't know, um, do a lot of free writing and uh, just let the work take me where it wants to go. So when I was writing the book, I considered, I knew it was nonfiction. Um, I knew it was creative nonfiction, but I didn't necessarily consider it a memoir. And I think that's because I had a very narrow understanding of what a memoir could be. I just thought it had to be, um, you know, something written by an older person who had an extraordinary or interesting life. And I don't consider myself someone who necessarily has a very interesting 
or extraordinary life. I have a very ordinary life. Um, but none of the book is out. A lot of people have been calling it a memoir. And I actually think it's kind of exciting because it opens up what that genre could be, right? And I appreciate you sort of um, recognizing how unconventional it is. Um, it is very different, I think, from the sort of like traditional memoir, but at the same time, I was very inspired by other Asian American women writers who had already been sort of opening up that field of creative nonfiction. Um, Jenny Bully, Lily Wong, a lot of whom have blurbed my books um, and who I really look up to. And so, I don't know, for me, creative nonfiction is a very exciting genre because it's so new. It's something that's being published mostly by a lot of smaller presses and independent presses right now in the United States. Um, and it feels like a very exciting time to be writing in that genre because it's kind of forming and coming into being. And I feel like I get to kind of shape, you know, um, what that genre is ultimately. The reason I think I chose creative nonfiction rather than fiction is because even though there is mythology, there is folklore, for me, those are my realities. I don't really think the book, um, so for example, the idea that I'm being created from my great grandfather, that is my truth. Um, it's not just an emotional truth, but it's also like a physical truth for me. And so I wanted to kind of break down these ideas of, you know, what is factual historical truth versus what is um, true for people who hold a worldview that isn't just like a Western worldview. Um, so I think that's why I wanted to make sure that this was marketed as like nonfiction because it is my reality. Thank you, Thiri. I mean, thank you for that, you know, kind of like a detailed uh, explanation. Um, uh, Charmaine, my next question is for you. I mean, Miss Burma is essentially a family story, but it's also a captivating portrait of how modern uh, Burma came to be. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you can be sympathetic to your family, uh, you know, kind of do good by them? Um, while also telling a broader political story. And I think Thiri, uh, after Charmaine kind of answers, feel free to jump in as well. You know, if you had an angry aunt about saying, why was I represented this way? Or, you know, where, where do you draw that line between uh, being true to the people you know and, and kind of being true to a broader history that people know, uh, Charmaine? Were there any conflicts that you had? Yeah, I think that... It, 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 to take on a project like this, I remember when I was initially writing it, I was on a job interview and I was describing the project to the people who were interviewing me, who were all writers. And one of them, who happened to be um, Asian American, uh, stopped me and he said, you know, what you're doing is impossible because we want to honor our family members, in particular, our mothers. Right. And one can't write a piece of fiction about one's mother and honor her and at the same time um, really do the, the, the messy dark work, the dangerous work of um, you know, revealing those latent qualities that are, that are unpretty. Um, and so it's a doomed project, he said to me. <laughs> I remember sort of staggering out of that interview and, and, and his words over the long period of time in which it took me to write this book because I think that you know in a way my my process of writing the book was one of getting past my allegiances to my family members while at the same time holding that in one hand um, at the same time trying to um, trying to honor my 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 sense of who they were um, and so Yes, it, it really was. Um, I think the process of writing the book was a slow process of, of, of getting past those allegiances, distilling them to an extent that they became characters. Um, there's probably more that I can say, but I, I'd love to leave room for the conversation. I hope, to, the, man, I hope the man who called the book a doom project got to read it, and I hope he knows just how <laughs> brilliant it is. Thiri, what do you have to say about this, you know, about the perils of borrowing from real life and real people, especially since your book is not being, I mean, while you want to be genre agnostic, since your book is kind of uh, 
being you know interpreted as non fiction i the perils are possibly greater for you than they are for charme so as an artist how much license do you think you have i mean this was the week that all i mean i certainly read the new york times kidney donor story you know how much can you appropriate etc so what do you have to say about this um i was definitely very anxious to write non fiction and to write about people living and dead um you know who have their own stories and i definitely didn't want to speak for anyone or silence anyone um and so i had a lot of anxieties to be honest yeah during the during the writing process and in the first few months after the book came out but i think one way i dealt with those anxieties was by being very transparent as an author to my reader um i think part of the reason the book is so formally experimental was because i was trying really hard not to have it be read as an authoritative text that's why there's so much blank space that's why there's fragmentation that's why there's meditations on language um and that's why sometimes i even write about myself in the third person right or use so i use different formal um structures to kind of like fragment and question the text as i was writing it and my hope was that by doing that i would signal to the reader that hey you're not reading you know the only story that exists you're reading specifically my very fragmented and subjective version um i don't know if that's enough i'm sure that one day there will be some people who are angry <laughs> or disagree with my reality um but luckily i was very collaborative with my parents and so you know they have been happy or not happy but for me it's almost like um the project was written in collaboration with them so i think i wasn't necessarily trying to yeah i won't i won't go into that but basically it was written in collaboration with them and so i feel like they have as much creative license with it as i did um and all of the family members and friends who have read the book have been very generous with me um the one difference between me and the kidney donor story maybe is that i actually had like a good relationship with all the people i'm writing about and kind of had their trust going into it and so i felt a little bit more comfortable um taking some liberties right what you're saying is so interesting theory in relation to an ongoing conversation that you know chima manda kind of formalized by saying you know speaking about the danger of the single story uh your memoir is a fragmented version or that it's simply your truth it's one person's story i think that's that's very interesting and i hope that you know even the coverage for the book because the book is just out so it's still getting written about i hope that the coverage for the book also kind of you know doesn't take it as a story of everyone all immigrants from burma so that's very interesting um charmin i saw your interview with you know the video interview with uh, jane smiley who's a writer that i i like a lot and i really enjoyed it was very candid conversation and uh, you said that you didn't want to write uh the first book that was uh, expected of you you said that you didn't want to write the first book um a first book that was expected of you um the immigrant story that looks like the disneyesque or kids strewn version of the story expected uh from a woman of color i thought it was a wonderful turn of phrase but um your first novel the good man was uh, not at all that i think no one can say that that was expected of you you were very careful to you know set it in europe it was a historical fiction all of that i wonder to what extent you thought you owed the world um uh, miss burma i know mira nair of the filmmaker kind of has said that if we don't tell our stories who will so she's very unapologetic about making all her movies uh, about you know indian immigrants in us um so similarly i mean did you kind of feel an impulse or a duty to write the book as the daughter of this a uh, revolutionary figure or as somebody who shares this very interesting and uh, you know unique heritage uh, did you feel a kind of duty that you know you as charmin craig had to write the story otherwise who would i absolutely felt that duty and i think i felt that duty even before i conceived of myself as a writer i remember being a very small child and trying to tell the story in poems and um 
uh, later trying to write it as a screenplay and feeling that I didn't have the narrative chops or the, um, the, the, the sort of political and historical awarenesses that I would need to, to communicate a story like this. Um, I remember when, when I was done writing the book, I, I felt this tremendous sense of relief because I, I did palpably feel that I had um, finally um, sort of <laughs> succeeded and not succeeded, like the book is a great set, but I had finally sort of gotten something off my back that I had been carrying, if you will, for decades. Um, and, you know, I remember having a conversation with another writer at this time. Here I am, I, I keep quoting other writers, but this, this other writer who I was talking to after I finished my book said, I can't imagine doing what you did, writing something for 15 years out of a profound sense of duty. Um, but I think perhaps because my mother's people, during their, their centuries of enslavement, they had their hands cut off if they were found with writing implements. Um, it's such that they lost their written language. Um, all there was was sort of oral stories. Um, there was no more even alphabet. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 there is a way in which I think that I had in, in consumed or imbibed some of the, um, the prejudices, the biases that I came up with as a writer um, that we shouldn't tell political stories, that we should tell stories that are just about ourselves, that as a woman, you should champion oneself, oneself, one's own narrative, and that to take on and feel sort of duty bound to tell the stories of others is in some ways weak or feeble or um, anti-feminist or something. And so part of writing the book was, a, was a, for me, was a sort of in, kind of a, a reconceiving of that bias for myself and and sort of embracing my human um, instinct to care for um, uh, others to um, to really reckon with my own deep sense of um, connectedness to Burma and, and my mother's story and to um, do everything I could to bring to light um, a, a, an essentially forcibly vanished story of my mother's people, which wasn't easy because writing the book, I, I began as a, it began as sort of purely literary exercise and it ended up becoming more journalistic um, than I had anticipated it would be. Right, but uh, tell us a little bit about the 15 years, you know, how, how had you, when you started off, had you envisioned a completely different book? I mean, I'm sure, some of it changed, you know, 15 years, you change as a person, it's a long time, but was there a fundamental difference with what you had started off with and the book that we now see? Uh, Completely different. I, I actually wrote the first seven years were made up writing a very different book. I wrote a, a completely different book that was much more a product of this other mindset that I have, that, that I must not tell a political story, that I must not feel duty bound to do so, that it wasn't my place or my responsibility necessarily to tell the story of, of the Karen people in Burma. Um, and that I should uh, sort of kind of try very much not to tell a historical story. So the first, the first seven years were spent writing a book that was actually skirted the line of, of um, autobiography, memoir, and fiction much more. It was, much, it was the story of myself and my mother. And it was based in the United States. Um, it was more fragmentary. Um, it was really about a mother-daughter relationship and about the impossibility of understanding one's mother. It was much more, um, much more a sort of uh, story about the legacy of trauma. I figured largely in the book. Um, and ultimately, um, I, I, I let it go because I realized it was sort of a grand exercise in avoiding, <laughs> avoiding this duty that was nagging at me, this duty to tell, to really get into and tell um, the story of my mother's people. And, um, and that to understand my mother I, 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 and to really understand her motivations and decisions, I had to... I had to look not only at her parents, those who came before her, but but at 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 the at the place they lived and and at their history. And so that's when I 
I began this, the, the second seven years were, were made up of writing the version that you see. Right. Um, Thierry, you spoke briefly about, you know, some of your formal choices uh, and your book. I mean, I think right from, you know, the first few pages reading it, one knows that it has a very unique structure. Since both of your books, you know, Charmaine's book and your book, uh, the idea of this kind of post-colonial identity or the idea of identity is so central to it. I wonder how much of these structural choices were an attempt to also be subversive to kind of, you know, turn on its head the, the, the time renowned, you know, the kind of the, the narrative, the structure of books that we know, uh, you know, not even your kind of chronology, uh, your braiding together a, a back to front and a front to back chronology. Uh, there are the white spaces, there's the first person, third person, there's, there's a lot of uh, structural experiments happening. So how much of it was kind of, you know, a conscious choice to be subversive? Subversive is a really interesting word. I think um, I've often been asked if I'm being subversive or experimental um, or resisting forms sort of like actively, you know, as a choice. And I think for me, I don't, it might be subversive as an effect, but for me, the intentionality is not necessarily to um, move away from some normative hegemonic center that I, I believe has power, but to instead sort of um, imagine what it would be like if I didn't, if I didn't, uh, you know, think of myself in relation to this normative hegemonic center, and I didn't think of myself as detracting from it or moving away from it. Um, and so basically what I'm trying to say is to also quote from other writers, Charmaine, um, one of my favorite writers, Janice Lee, talks about how she isn't an experimental writer. She just has to create new forms that contain her stories because the containers that already exist um, cannot you know, serve the sort of stories she wants to tell. And that's kind of how I feel. Um, at the same time, I do think like all writers, I'm responding to pressures that I've had in my life. And um, they're a little bit different from Charmaine's pressures. I think I felt like I immigrated to the United States when I was seven. And ever since I was in like third grade, I've had people try to use me as an educational resource on the history and politics of Myanmar, which is a very complicated, difficult thing, even for like a historian, right? Um, but as, as like an eight-year-old, that was sort of my duty. So that's been sort of my duty my whole life growing up in the United States. And I think when I started taking an interest in writing, um, when I started becoming educated and fluent in English and sort of um, seen as like, you know, this Americanized product of my family, I was told over and over again by everybody, friends, writing mentors, teachers, strangers, like, oh, you have to write about your people and your country. And I think for me, I had a difficult time understanding what that meant, um, right? Because I don't have any memories of Burma and like there's a lot of silences in my family where people don't talk about the past um, because of the trauma of having to leave and the trauma of the dictatorship. And so, yeah, I think I just felt like a lot of pressure to sort of move away from that. And when I was younger as a writer, I did not write about even Asian American characters, much less Burmese American characters, because I really wanted to create this distance between my identity as a writer and this pressure that I felt to be representative of something bigger than myself. But I think after my first novel came out, um, people were reading autobiography into my novel, even though it was a work of fiction and it's sort of a speculative work of fiction. Um, and I realized there actually could be power in me getting to set the terms of the conversation around my identity and my experience. And so I think the reason I decided to turn to nonfiction and write Names for Light was because I you know, wanted to finally take that power back for myself. Um, and that's why there are all these formal choices in there too to answer your initial question. I, I kind of detracted away from that. Well, I mean, that's that's what the conversation is meant to be. We should take it wherever it goes. But uh, tell me, Thiri, were there memoirs that inspired you, that kind of encouraged you to go the route 
that you went, either by Asian American women or or just by anyone. Uh, you know, what were yeah. some of the books that you were reading? Yeah, I actually made a whole list and I could even share that in the chat with people. Um, if I'll, I'll say it out loud first and then I'll share it in the chat because I do really want to honor the books that came before me. Um, How Kelly Ya's Fong memory, Family Memoir, I think that was a memoir that made me realize that it doesn't have to be just about you, it can be about your family and your ancestors too. And like I've always had a relationship with myself as integrated with the past um, so that was really helpful. Um, Michael and Dachi's Running in the Family, Lily Wong's A Bestiary, Janice Lee's Reconsolidation, which is about the death of her mother, Sila Satterstrom's Ideal Suggestions, um, Mary Kim Arnold's Let Me for a Long Moment, um, Ella Longpreet's How to Keep You Alive, Claudia Rankin's Don't Let Me Be Lonely, Christian Hockey's Ventrekel. So, so many books um, that spanned, you know, decades of reading that I think kind of gave me permission to write this book that I did. Right. Uh, Shamin, what about you? Were there novels uh, that kind of marry the personal and political or, you know, kind of that speak about a family, but actually speak about a, a larger nation or, or a people that kind of, that you really like reading uh, as a kind of lead up to writing this or that have influenced you in the past? You know, this, this is, you know, I was looking at actually Russian novels, as odd as that might sound, but something like Pasternak's um, Zhivago, you know, that um, was a wonderful model for me because it's a, a grand story of that takes place over a lot of time that um, is sprawling, but never loses sight of the personal, the interpersonal um, love, but also the, the natural world and um and and the human relationship to the elements and so that um, you know there were there were a lot of different models i should say but but that is one that um was helpful to me right right uh Shamin, in a lot of your writing and you know in some of your interviews you've spoken a lot about the sense of not belonging even though you're you know it, your, your father is American, but I think you, you felt the sense of not belonging uh, in the US or, or anywhere. Um, how did writing this book uh, help you kind of, do you think, I mean, if it did at all, did it help you belong? Did it help you kind of reclaim some part of your unique identity? Well, I'll tell a little, a, a little story. I remember two little stories. The first time that I went to um, Burma and to the Karen area there, I was 22 years old. And I remember immediately having this incredible feeling of peace coming over me, like, oh my gosh, like there's some, for some reason, I understood myself better. I felt as if it were a real homecoming. And I was, I remarked on this to my sister who was accompanying me there. And literally at that very moment, a bunch of children ran around us and said in Karen, which we did understand this, they said, um, good evening, white people. And um, it was sort of like, oh, well, I guess I need to be a little more skeptical of my feeling of belonging, even in this context. Flash forward, the last time I went, um, a Karen man said to me, um, so what are you, Charmaine? Are you American or are you Karen? And I said, you know, I think I'm both. And he said, wrong answer, you're Karen. And so that, um, that's it. I, I, <laughs> there has always been this feeling that others might want to put a label on one. Um, and yet it's always a label that doesn't feel authentic to or fully descriptive of, you know, <laughs> of what I am. And I think it's, it's sort of part of the, 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 the experience of someone who is displaced or is mixed, mixed race, that kind of thing. So writing this book, I, I guess that um, I can't say that it necessarily um, did anything for my feeling of belonging, but, um, and yet I will say that it has connected me in a really lovely way to a lot of people in Burma that I, I hadn't anticipated and to the wider refugee community um, in the United States. So it's been really um, 
that has been something that I didn't anticipate, that I would get to meet so many people, be embraced by so many people, both in this country, the United States and in Burma, um, because they've connected to the book. So I don't know if that answers your question. Right. But. No, it does. And your book has been translated and published in, in Burma as well, right? Um, yes, did, did you find that, um, that, you know, readers in the U.S. and readers in Burma responded uh, to very different parts or different aspects of the book? Um, you know, was that, I mean, I don't know how much interaction you've been able to have with your readers there also because of COVID and, you know, your book was out a couple of years before. So, uh, but do you think that the takeaways are very different based on the identity of the person? Don't, I can't answer that because I don't, I don't really, I'm hesitant to sort of, um, group everyone together in Burma or the United States. Um, but I, I, I think that what I can say is that I, I was nervous about the translation because I, I didn't know how faithful it would be. Um, I was, there was one, one part where I remember the translator saying to me he couldn't include um, in, in the book. Um, and because it was too, I guess, violent. Um, and so, you know, the, but in spite of that, some, some, some differences, and I think in the, in the actual text and the translation, um, I've really just been kind of amazed by the, uh, just how uh, receptive people have been in both countries and and you know looping back to your question about family and duty um i've also been incredibly relieved and gratified that that my family members have have similarly taken this in the spirit of um you know as as a sort of a labor of love and as a gift which is how it was intended um so that's been Nice. I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, no, it does. It does. Absolutely. And we actually have a lot of audience uh, questions coming in. So I'm going to start by picking out some of them for Charmaine and for Thiri. Um, Thiri, there's one for you from Kenny who asks, um, has there been any particular incident or roadblock that has appeared in your writing of this book? which perhaps led you to unlearn a lot of your family history or your own understanding of your past? That's a really fascinating question. <laughs> um, there have absolutely been plenty of roadblocks um, along the way. And I think, like I mentioned earlier, there were a lot of silences in my family. Um, and absences and things that we didn't talk about and things that I was afraid to ask about and talk about. So I interviewed my parents for a number of years um, in order to write this book. I kept returning to them to keep asking them the same questions over and over again. Um, and I think that it wasn't until very late in the writing process that I became more comfortable with asking my parents um, about like my brother's death, for example. That was something that they had talked about a lot um, when I was growing up, but it was never something that I could interrogate them about. Um, same with the years that followed when we first immigrated to the United States when our family situation was quite precarious. Like we never really talked about that either. And so, I think the, writing the book did force me to have conversations with my family members that I probably would not have had otherwise. And it did um, teach me new things that I didn't know, right? Like I didn't know, for example, that the, the book is named after my brother in a way um, because I didn't know that he had a name basically until I wrote this book. He had a nickname that we called him, but I didn't realize that they had given him like a name he was meant to have, you know, when he grew up um, until like the very end of writing this book. And so there were moments like that for sure um, that were very humbling. And in a way it made me terrified because I thought, oh no, I've already written the book and it's slated for publication and I'm still discovering new things and revisions I need to make. And so 
I, I did feel terrified that this was going to be, a, you know, this book was going to be kind of stuck in time and it was eventually going to be outdated as I continued to talk more and more with my family. But I'm okay with that. This is just a moment in time. It's not, you know, the ultimate story of me or my family or anything like that. Um, so I, I think of it as a sort of living, breathing history. Right. And you're going to write many more books. So some of that could kind of creep in, you know, elsewhere, right? I know Charmaine's been asked a lot of times if there's a sequel. But even if there isn't mm -hmm. like a, you know, a sequel, sequel, I'm sure that some of these things that you feel you weren't able to say in this, I'm sure they'll, they'll kind of make their way into your other writing, uh, right, in some way. Um, there's a question from Elga um, addressed to both of you, so feel free to pick it up, uh, uh, you know, whichever one of you wants to. Um, it's, what is your relationship to an inherited history of colonialism and dictatorship? Okay, well, I guess I can try to take that on and, and maybe anyone can jump in. Um, you know, I have to say that my relationship to, I'll just speak about as a, as a sort of person with, with Karen family, it was complicated um, because um, for the Karen people, there was a way that they were rescued from enslavement um, during during the period of colonialism in Burma. It was a, a sort of respite from um, enslavement. Um, and so part of my project in the book was to trouble um, some sort of, of my own preconceptions about such things as um, colonialism, um, just as I'm trying um, with characters to uh, to present the ways that they uh, contradict themselves. In other words, their, their, their deepest contradictions and complexities. So too with these political ideas such as colonialism. Um, I was trying in the book as honestly and um, courageously as I possibly could, though I sometimes felt myself sort of shirking away from, from, from these more dangerous ideas. Or, for example, um, uh, m missionizing of the Karen people. The Karens, many of them are, are Christian, not all. Um, but that was something as an American I, I, I was very suspicious of, worried about. And um, I tried to, even with something like that, um, by, by telling the singular story, by telling stories of characters, and not necessarily of, of um, uh, you know, writing this as nonfiction, I think I was able to get into a more, um, I hope, uh, complicated view of such things as co colonialism. Right. That's a, that's a great answer, Charmaine. Um, Thierry, is, is there something you'd like to add to that? I think we're nearing the end of our session, but if there's something you'd just like to say. Um... Yeah, absolutely. I, I also was trying to have a complicated relationship to colonialism and to dictatorship, which I think was very hard for me to do in my daily life as a Burmese person, because those were often the first questions that people, white people would ask me um, growing up and, you know, even as an adult where they would say like, oh, Burma, I've heard about that because X was it colonized by the British or Y, like, you know, I've heard of this like crime against humanity happening in that country because of the dictatorship or even prior to the dictatorship. Um, and I think that like, what's weird because on the one hand, I sort of resented those overtures. So slightly because of the way in which they were, people would ask me these questions, you know, without even introducing themselves um, or just like strangers would come up to me and, and just launch in. But on the other hand, like when I was in college, I was a part of Brown Campaign for Burma and was you know, I was very politicized um, when I was younger. I never thought to write about it, but I was very politicized when I was younger. Um, and I think one of the things that I have been grappling with my whole life as a Burmese American immigrant is, is this knowledge that like, 
I'm part of the Bamar ethnicity, which is the dominant ethnicity in Burma, the majority ethnicity that historically um, oppressed other minority ethnicities, including the Karen. And I think that for me, it's something I've had to struggle with is like, how do I reconcile this privilege that I know I have, and yet I haven't actually experienced living outside of Burma? Um, although at the same time, I probably have experienced it, and maybe I just haven't you know, been in touch with it. Like, for example, I tutored Korean refugees when I was in college, and I actually don't know if like that relationship, you know, was something that um, they felt uncomfortable with because I was Bamar, for example. But I was just forced to tutor them because there was nobody living in the city of Providence who spoke Burmese aside from me. Um, and so I was just assigned de facto, right? And so I think there's a way in which for people who are immigrants or in the diaspora, we all get lumped together, uh, which is problematic for sure because there are differing privileges back in the homeland, right? Um, and this is true of like every country um, but yeah, it's still something that I'm trying to grapple with um, and to think of myself as a person who is contingent and who isn't a complete victim, a complete oppressed person or a complete oppressor. I think too often people of color in America are forced into being in one camp or the other, you know, as like, I am just the complete victim or I am completely an evil brown person. I'm either the noble savage or the savage savage. And I think I've been trying to figure out how to break out of those paradigms and those dichotomies. Thank you, Thierry. And I definitely think that, you know, the problem that both you and Charmaine have pointed out, I mean, I think one way out of it is to read more, is to read more singular stories, is to read more fiction, it's to read more unconventional memoirs, and it's to read uh, books by these two wonderful women here in the session right now here with me. Uh, we have to unfortunately uh, wrap up now, but uh, I mean, for everyone listening in, I think you can get a, a lot more detail, a lot more nuance, a lot more kind of um, a deep dive into what we've spoken about when you read Miss Burma and Names for Light. Um, thank you so much, Charmaine and Thiri, and over to you. Uh, Sharupa. Thank you. Thank you, Charmaine Thiri and Anandita for sharing your stories, thoughts, experiences, and understandings with us. Thank you. That was really such a warm session. Thank you all for watching and being a great audience. We encourage you to buy the books of our speakers. They are all available at the Boulder Bookstore. If you like the session, do consider supporting us through the support GLF option button on the right hand side of your screen. Your support is greatly appreciated. We would like to thank all our official partners. We hope you all enjoyed these conversations and will tune back for the next session. Appleseed, Matt Bell in conversation with Laird Hunt. This will be at 10 a.m. Mountain Time, which is 11 a.m. Central Time, 9 a.m. Pacific Time, 12 p.m. Eastern Time, and of course, it's 9.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Thank you once again. And we now present a, J we now present a writer shorts from our JLF writer short series. Hi, I'm Anindita Ghosh. My debut novel, The Illuminated, will be published by HarperCollins India in July 2021. I hope my book finds its way to readers and book lovers who, like me, believe that now more than ever, books are our portals to brave new worlds. The Illuminated is the story of two women, a mother and daughter, Shashi and Tara, who are forced to see the world anew when Roby Malik, the renowned architect around whom their lives revolve, dies suddenly. The women grapple with a world that is changing rapidly marked by a rising tide of religious fundamentalism. But Shashi and his spirited daughter Tara, an ambitious young Sanskrit scholar, must project a way forward that is of their own choosing. The idea of multiple perspectives has always been of interest to me. The characters in The Illuminated have very divergent worldviews and they must explore the full spectrum of possibilities and perhaps the full spectrum of truth to arrive at their own source of light. 
I suppose in some ways it is a response to my reservations about groupthink and outrage culture. Things are not always as they seem and the best we can do for ourselves and for those around us is to commit to an exploration. I've been a journalist and an editor for 15 years now. I get asked a lot if that helped in writing fiction. If I'm being honest, it did not. Fiction demands an entirely different approach. It encourages you to inhabit characters without judgment. The Illuminated is a novel about perception. When the light shifts, you see the world differently. The metaphor of light is powerful and universal. From the Upanishads to Dante, from Rumi to Victor Hugo, Audre Lorde spoke about the quality of light by which we scrutinize our lives. And just earlier this year, the young poet Amanda Gorman concluded her dazzling performance with the metaphor of light. And it is to this world of light that I invite readers to journey into the world of the illuminated with me. Thank you. A festival like this is a beautiful indication of the kind of uh, thing that I, I truly, truly believe in and I think makes our society uh, more whole and more pure. We do not take it for granted that Boulder was chosen as the first North American uh, satellite festival. Um, it's a huge honor we will not forget and we are enriched because of it. We are indebted to the, both the local and international people that came together to make that happen. and. Um, we hope it's a tradition that continues for decades to come. Literary festivals like this one build up an environment and an ecosystem to nurture readers and to promote the business of books. They provide an invaluable forum for writers to connect with other creative people. Uh, we sit there peering into uh, those uh, electronic uh, uh, grids in front of our eyes uh, and it only increases the desire to hit, see the real thing in the flesh. Uh, to actually hear an author speak firsthand, to read from their work, to hear the tones of their voice uh, modulate as they read their most treasured passages of prose. Uh, for us it's special, this was our mothership and it continues to be. The other editions that we have across the United States are smaller versions, different programming but smaller versions. sense to me religion and art are the same thing. They're vaguely irrational, but they help make sense of things. Someone who lives with no arts and no religion has very little to live on. 2019 was the 14th consecutive year of decline in global freedom. You have to think of viruses as intelligent machines, as code crackers. And like all living forms, they have to adapt to their environment. Imagination is a powerful tool. It doesn't matter which part of the world we are in our situation. Are we behind locked bars? Are we roaming freely, independent thought and process? Our imagination allows us to soar out of any present circumstances that we find ourselves in. And that really is the power of literature and the written word. It allows us to envision a better future. It allows us to consider our past and make sense of the present. Imagination is a tool to be able to free us from the binds and the constrictions that we find ourselves locked into. We can break free, we can soar through the universe, we can rise up into the darkened night like a firefly illuminating the world. This is what JLF Golden Colorado hopes to bring you something to fire your imagination.